The debate about how much intelligence we're born with and how much we accumulate, nature versus nurture, has been pretty much settled. Most geneticists agree it's about 50-50. But at King's College in London, the scientist who's famous for discovering the intelligent gene, Robert Cloman, believes it's a little more complicated than that. The question of the heritability of intelligence, how heritable it is, is, some, is uh, has been uh, asked about uh, since 1925 with the first twin and adoption studies. And since then, it's been studied more than any other trait in science. Now, this is administering standard IQ sorts of tests, and we could uh, debate what those mean. But whatever they mean, they're very strongly heritable in all of these studies. If you take all the world's literature on, say, well over 10,000 pairs of twins and you know 50,000 family members, and you put it all together, you come up with an estimate of about 50% heritable. Personality, for example, is 40% heritable. Some things are more heritable. But what's interesting is if you then divide the sample into those uh, uh, studies that considered children, say, below the age of 10, heritability is much less strong, more like 30%. And then if you look at older, middle-aged adults, heritability is higher, perhaps 60-70%. So heritability of intelligence as measured by IQ tests is increasing during the lifespan. So there's no simple answer to the question, how heritable is it? Because heritability goes up almost linearly throughout the lifespan. So as you age, chances are you'll get about half your intelligence from your parents and increasing your odds in the brain department is what this man is selling. For in his metal suitcase, Paul Smith carries semen from donors who are chosen because of their brains. A sperm bank for women who want children smarter than the rest of us. Heredity Choice has a catalogue which gives short biographical notes on each donor. You choose your donor, Mr. Smith, whose email nom de plume is Stork, then arranges the rest. The most popular semen in the catalogue comes from a university professor who is the biological father of over 40 children and who is usually selected because he's described as very bright. It's most important to make sure people understand that just by saying genetic influence is substantial, it doesn't mean that your intelligence is determined, that there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, in the extreme, you can imagine taking a kid who's born to very bright parents, but you take the kid away, put him in a dark closet, the child's going to be retarded. For medical writer Carlin Abraham, the drive for smarter children has simply become part of our social fabric. It's the last frontier of discrimination that we accept as a society. Sort of, it's, it's politically correct still to not give someone a job if they're not smart enough. So, I mean, if this is what we all want for our kids, and we all, you know, we, we do all kinds of other things to, to make them more intelligent because we think we're going to give them a better chance at life, I guess the question is, um, are we really going to resist um, you know, genetic enhancements. I'm not saying they'd be the answer. I'm not even saying that morally that's what we want to do. But I think that that's a threshold that we'll cross sooner rather than later. Since he started this work in the late 1960s, Paul Smith has assisted in the conception of hundreds of babies. Babies whose genetic makeup, it is hoped, carries the potential for intelligence and who might grow up to be as smart as these kids at the transitional school at the University of British Columbia, where extra smart children come, as young as 12, to prepare for university entrance. It was from a group like this that Robert Plowman took DNA samples to trace the genetic origins of intelligence. The first law of genetics is that like begets like. You share 50% of your genes with your first degree relatives, parents, and siblings. The second law is like does not beget like. You know, you don't share 50% of your genes. And, and that is really what sex is about, is creating this 50% genetic similarity and difference among relatives. So most of the brightest people in America don't come from the very brightest families, because there aren't very many very bright families. Most of the brightest kids come from average sorts of families. 
And that's, you know, I think a great sort of democratic, um, equalizing, you know, liberal way of thinking about genetics.